All right, welcome to the Woodlands Plastic Surgery Q&A Live. Um, I am Dr. Correa. I am your local board certified plastic surgeon here to answer any and all questions related to plastic surgery. Um, so with no further ado, let's get started. Um, this week we've got a couple good new ones and then um, we've got one left over from last week. We'll go ahead and start with that one. Um, that one had asked, um, <clears throat> what point do you need an arm lift or a thigh lift versus just lipo? Um, so I see a, you'll see a common thread through body contouring about this question of when can we do a more limited approach versus a excisional approach, a more limited approach requiring fewer incisions, usually less recovery. So like liposuction versus a tummy tuck, liposuction versus a thigh lift or an arm lift. And ultimately this boils down to, are we dealing with a skin problem or are we dealing with a fat problem or are we dealing with both? Um, if it's a skin problem, then we generally need some sort of excisional procedure to do that. And that could be a breast lift is considered an excisional procedure. So is a tummy tuck, so is an arm lift, so is a thigh lift. Um, and then the other component for liposuction is how good is the skin? And by good, what I mean is how much elasticity do we have in the skin? Um, skin elasticity is huge in terms of getting a good liposuction result. And so if you're someone who has very little skin excess, but you just have kind of thick thighs or thick arms that you're not happy with, um, but your skin is really tight, it's not very loose, um, then you can potentially get away with just a liposuction procedure. And we talked one week about what is that shrink wrap concept, and that's the concept of the really tight skin or very elastic skin will shrink wrap down around that um, around that liposuction result. So you suck out all the fat and then the skin shrink wraps and tightens up around that. The problem is if you do that in somebody, in somebody who doesn't have very good skin elasticity, the skin doesn't shrink wrap down, it basically just drops and falls. And so you end up getting kind of a fall or a fold or a, a fullness that generally doesn't look very good. And that's where we start talking about doing a li uh, arm lift, thigh lift um, versus doing just a liposuction procedure. Um, so it's very case by case. Um, and you know, some patients it's black and white, hey, you definitely need to do a thigh lift or an arm lift. Liposuction alone would, be, would not be a good idea. And then there are other patients um, where it's no brainer, definitely liposuction is the ticket, avoid the scar, easier recovery, et cetera. Then there's a whole lot of patients that are kind of in between where there's ups and downs to each decision, we might stage it and say, hey, why don't we, you know, you seem like a good liposuction candle, let's see if we can get away with the, the lower, you know, the, the smaller surgery, smaller recovery, smaller scars, give it three to six months, see how you heal up with, if we end up with a skin issue we don't like, we can always go back and do that excisional procedure later. Um, in really ambiguous cases, where we're really trying to avoid an, an, a scar that we may not need. So, um, that's kind of the story with that. Um, up next, what is LiPo360? Um, LiPo360 is, I think it's a new terminology. Um, it's an excellent term. I do think that it um, is very descriptive. Um, it's not formally a plastic surgery operation or a title, but th what it refers to is doing a circumferential um, liposuction of the entire torso. So that basically would include your abdomen, flanks or love handles, um, and then lower back up to even mid back. Um, but it's, it's kind of imagine the area from the level of the breast down to the underwear line or the hip line. And it's basically an aggressive uh, liposuction of that entire area circumferentially. Um, <clears throat> what does that mean? Why, why is that terminology valuable? Um, because the, you know, up until then, we would have just called it uh, back liposuction. And most people don't think of their back as really an important aesthetic area, or we don't tend to think of it as, as kind of an aesthetic unit that demands attention or respect. People are concerned with their abdomen, their thighs, their hips, things like that. People don't really think as much about their back. Um, and so what gets missed in that is that the back has a very special relationship to the buttock and the waistline. Um, and if you look at Brazilian butt lift results, Brazilian butt lift is when we do the liposuction and fat grafting to the buttock, very popular procedure nowadays. Um, but if you look carefully at the results, probably 65, if not 70% of your result in a Brazilian butt lift is actually related to the lower back liposuction. Um, in many patients, as we gain weight, you gain weight in the posterior flank in my language, which is basically lower back kind of to the outside 
in you know lay language or, or common parlance. Um, and so anyway, it ends up from a from a, a view of the back, it basically ends up giving kind of a squarish appearance to the buttock, um, which most people don't like, um, would prefer to fix it. And so um, those patients often present for Brazilian butt lift because they think they want a bigger butt, a rounder butt, more shapely butt, um, a lifted butt, whatever it is, um, without just understanding, you know, why, why would you understand that um, unless you have, you know, plastic surgery training or, or you know, um, artistic training or something like that. Um, but anyway, by shaping that lower back, upper buttock area and doing that in a circumferential fashion, it basically is more of a butt shaping procedure than it is actually a lower back liposuction procedure. Um, and when you think of it that way, then kind of the value and um, power of the technique um, is more apparent and intuitive. And so in my opinion, that's the real value of that lipo360 concept. Um, is the treatment of the lower back buttock, and it really does shape the buttock and give it a round, the appearance of a rounder of, of a rounder shape. Um, I'd love I've got a couple patients on the gallery which are excellent examples. Um, unfortunately, Instagram and Facebook log me out if I don't have uh, you know censorship marks over um, you know breasts and genitalia. So. It's a bug I haven't quite sorted out yet in terms of how to easily show you guys uh, patient examples without getting shut down by Instagram and Facebook. Um, but I have a couple examples on the website you can look at. Um, they're not labeled though, so I apologize. I'll either figure out how to fix that bug or I can start putting in some descriptions in the gallery to help guide you on that. Um, but if you go to the Mommy Makeover Gallery and take a look at the results carefully, especially the, the side views and the diagonal views and look at kind of that hip hourglass area of the waistline, you can kind of see who gets an enhancement there and who doesn't. And maybe you can guess who got it, maybe you, maybe you can't. Um, but ultimately it's helpful to be able to show you those images. So I'll have to figure out how to do that. Cause right now, like I said, I, when I experimented with it before, they basically shut me down um, if there's a breast that is uncovered or, or anything like that. So um, part of my homework assignment, we'll call it. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, I'd like a very perky lifted C, but I breastfed and my double D's have lots of excess skin now. Um, so I think the question in there is, how do I get from point A to point B? Um, right now, I'm a double D, I have lots of excess skin. I'm not happy with that. I'd prefer to be C, I'd pr a smaller size. I'd prefer to be uh, perkier and, and higher up on my chest. How do we do that? Um, there's kind of... There's a couple different options. Um, the simple solution, based on just that very simple information, would be do a breast reduction. Um, doing a breast reduction will reduce the size of the breast and will also lift the breast up. Um, perkiness is a little bit of a nebulous term. Um, perkiness can refer to where the nipple is in position on the chest, meaning is it low on the chest? Everyone agrees that's not perky. Um, a nipple and areola that are higher up on the chest, many people consider that perky. Another aspect that I think is important is something that we call projection. Um, so you can have a nipple and areola that are in the correct spot on the breast, on the chest, but if the breast is kind of flat, then many people would say that that's not a perky breast. And so we plastic surgeons call that projection. And so depending on how important projection is to this patient, um, or the quality of their breast tissue, that's where we might start talking about putting an implant in for sake of shaping the breast, and maybe not so much for volume. And obviously in this case, she's a double D, she doesn't need volume actually, uh, she wants to be smaller, and so why would you place an implant? Uh, and the reason would be in her case to shape the breast and give it more projection. So if that patient comes in, she has amazing breast tissue, she's just um, too large and too droopy, um, then you just do a straightforward lift. I use the existing breast tissue, which is very dense, has a lot of elasticity, has a lot of um, internal structure. And I use that to shape the breast and that usually gives enough projection that it does look perky. Um, and again, going to the gallery, there are several examples of that in the mommy makeover category. The top left comes to mind actually at the top of my head um, of someone who does not have an implant, but has, in my opinion, a very nice result of a, a lift and a small reduction without any implant whatsoever. Um, in the same gallery, there's patients who got a lift, did not want an implant, and you can tell from the profile view that it's a little bit flatter. Um, and in my opinion, it might be made nicer by putting a small implant in, um, but ultimately that's up to the patient to decide what's important to them and what they like and what, what, what you know, they think is nice. And so um, 
so anyway, for that patient, what I'd say is, you know, if you have really good dense breast tissue and want to be smaller, you might be able to avoid an implant. Um, if you really want a nice deal of projection or some more shapeliness to the breast, uh, and your, your tissue has lost elasticity, lost internal structure, the, the glandular tissue is not quite as dense anymore, it's softer, you may want to place a small implant. Um, again, not for volume, but just for shape. All right. Um, Non-surgical rhinoplasty questions. So explain the difference between filler versus surgery for rhinoplasty. Are fillers permanent? Um, there's all sorts of fillers. Some are permanent, some are not. The ones that we use in the nose are generally not permanent. And generally speaking, it's not a great idea to put permanent fillers in that part of the, of the face. Um, so we typically use a restal, uh, I'm sorry, a hyaluronic acid product like a restylane or like a Juvederm um, to build that up. But that product is temporary and lasts, you know, scientifically speaking, it lasts 12 months, meaning if we took a biopsy, we'd still see some hyaluronic acid in there. How long does the effect last where it's like you maintain the result that you're getting? Six to nine months, depending upon um, kind of how severe the, the, the issue is that we're trying to fix um, and how much product we have to put in. Um, ultimately, what a, what a lot of patients do, they'll come in for their initial treatment where it might take one or two sessions to build things up, shape things exactly how we want them. And then for maintenance, it's something where you come in maybe once every six months and it's not a full syringe, it's just something where you maybe use part of that to touch up the nose and maintain that and then use the rest of the syringe somewhere else to enhance some other part or something like that. Um, and so, you know, there's some subjectivity in terms of how long it lasts. Um, if, you know, looking at it from a different angle, if somebody came in and said, do my nose, fill it, you do it, and they say, wow, this is awful, I absolutely hate it, when is this gonna go away? More like nine months, nine to 12 months before it's completely gone. Um, and so, um, so anyway, the point is it's temporary, and if you wanna maintain that result, you're looking at kind of a maintenance schedule of every six to nine months, depending upon just individual differences. Um, compare that versus rhinoplasty. So the biggest difference, so obviously surgery is permanent, um, the other big difference is the power or um, versatility and ability and tools that surgery provides versus a filler. A filler is actually extremely limited in terms of what we can do safely um, to shape a nose. It's very much limited to just a, a mild bump on the bridge of the nose and even not necessarily 100% of those bumps. Um, a conversation I commonly have with my rhinoplasty patients is that if you you know, a lot of people come in and say, I just hate the hump under the bridge of my nose. I'm fine with everything else. Just fix the hump. And the conversation I always have is that if you only fix a hump in isolation, um, you can commonly end up with the illusion that your nose has gotten longer. Um, I can show that with, soft, with uh, my simulation software. Um, and it's an optical illusion in the sense that I'm not changing the distance from here to here. But because you lower that, it just looks longer. Um, it has to do with a facial proportion aspect. It has to do with a proportion, with a um, projection aspect. Um, but the point is most of those patients benefit from elevating the tip just a little bit to kind of bounce it out. And in common rhinoplasty uh, lingo, we say we want a balanced result or a harmonious result. And that's an example where we do kind of these, these small tweaks and balancing acts within the nose where even if we just wanna treat this, often we'll end up treating the tip as well to kind of keep things meshing internally so they look natural. Um, so anyway, with filler, we are very limited in that this is kind of the only safe area that you can inject, um, and it needs to be a somewhat modest hump, um, just because you can only inject so much filler safely. Um, I don't inject any filler beyond pretty much the middle third of the nose. You start getting in the tip area, in my opinion, that's a little bit risky, and I'm just not comfortable um, doing that. Um, and even the middle third of the nose, again, I, I'm talking tiny, tiny amounts to just adjust some very subtle asymmetries, things like that. The bulk of the product is gonna be up in the, the upper part of the nose to camouflage um, uh, a hump deformity, um, or, or, or dorsal hump is what we call it. Um, rhinoplasty, on the other hand, we can treat every part of the nose, virtually every part of the nose. Um, very powerful technique, obviously it is surgery, um, but it's permanent, and depending upon you know, the severity of things or how much things bother you, it might be something that you're not interested in a temporary fix. You want all of it done and you want all of it done forever and you're ready for surgery. Other people might have a modest uh, uh, hump on the bridge 
or it doesn't bother them enough to undergo surgery and they're happy to just kind of treat it every once in a while to kind of enjoy that benefit for a while and then they avoid surgery. So, um, you know, it, it's it's another option, I guess, is the way I would look at it. It's definitely not a cure-all, um, but it serves a nice purpose and it's also a, a, a nice way for people to kind of try things out, so to speak, and, and see if they like what results are like before doing something permanent like surgery. So, um, well, that wraps up for today. Um, Thank you very much for joining us. Um, again, submit your questions. You can really submit them anytime. You can email the, the front office. We'll put them onto the queue. Um, we always put up a reminder on Instagram stories. Um, and if we're not on Facebook stories, we should be soon. Um, and then uh, by all means, tell your friends. Um, you know, this is meant to be enjoyable, informative, um, hopefully entertaining. Um, you're welcome to submit technical questions, um, questions about celebrities, television shows, um, anything you like. You can submit photographs, um, whatever you want. Just just give us a, a contact us and, and we'll take a look at things and um, present it on, on the feed. So hope everyone's having a good week. Um, um, today is Tuesday, everyone's favorite day of the week. Um, and good luck with the rest of the week. Have a good one. Bye.